Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webcast. I'm Adrian Lee, an editor in the Globe and Mail's opinion section, stepping in for my colleague, Alex Posatsky, who unfortunately couldn't be here today. Uh, I'm looking forward to moderating today's discussions. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge that the Globe and Mail's headquarters is situated on the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. My colleagues and I are grateful for the opportunity to live and work on this land. Uh, one bit of housekeeping, uh, during the last 10 minutes of the panel, we'll be answering audience questions. So if you have one for a panelist, please type them in uh, in the virtual Q&A box. Uh, and don't hesitate to submit your question as soon as it comes to mind, because if I can transition to it uh, mid-conversation and get to it when it makes sense, I'll be doing that. Uh, on behalf of the Globe and Mail, I also want to recognize Sira for supporting today's event. Mush, it's not just for Siberian Husky anymore. It's an acronym that stands for municipalities, universities, school boards, and hospitals, which all store some of Canadians' most sensitive information and data. Uh, of course, that also makes that information some of Canada's most desirable data for cyber criminals. Even within MUSH, though, the four categories of institutions face their own unique challenges, including often a lack of resources to adequately protect themselves from cyber attacks. So with the data stake so high, how do we safeguard the sector? And that's the big question we'll be tackling today with cybersecurity experts who can speak to what can be done. Joining me today, we have Ritesh Kotak, Technology and Security Analyst at Ritesh Kotak Consulting. We have John Ferguson, Cyber President of Cyber and DNS at CIRA, David Trin, Chief Technology Officer at Infocom Cyber, and Donna Kidwell, Acting Chief Information Officer at the University of Toronto. Thanks uh, all for joining me. Uh, so I think we'll just start, uh, we'll go left to right here. Uh, everyone can just start by sharing in just a minute or so how you relate to today's conversation. Starting with Ritesh. Perfect. Um, first of all, thank you so much for having me. It's an absolute pleasure and I look forward to the conversation. So my area normally deals with the legal side of it, but also the technical side of breaches. So I get called when there's organizations that are essentially going through probably is what is the most difficult time that an organization will go through, and that is dealing with a dealing with a cyber breach. So I started my career in policing, spent about eight years, seven years uh, with two police services, went to big tech, and then decided to become a lawyer. So I kind of approach these issues from wearing different uh, different hats and, and I'm looking forward to having this conversation and answering all the questions that uh, that get thrown at us. Great, and uh, John? Thanks, Adrian. Yep, John Ferguson, uh, VP of Cybersecurity and DNS at CIRA. CIRA is uh, probably uh, best known to the folks in the audience as the .ca people. We keep uh, Canadian websites uh, online and running efficiently, and, and we do that through sort of the, the series of domain name system uh, infrastructure around the world, uh, registry services, so your web hosting provider can sell you a domain. And then there, there's a whole group uh, within our organization that's focused on servicing cybersecurity needs of organizations. And uh, as a national not-for-profit, we're very much focused in helping support the, the, the MUSH sector, as well uh, as medium and small business. So uh, we spend a lot of time uh, helping train uh, and deploy various uh, network security tools uh, within the sector. And uh, that's sort of the, the lens we'll bring to the, the conversation today. That's great. Go to David. Yes, uh, my name is David and I'm the CTO of Infocom Cyber. Uh, we specialize in cybersecurity assessment and training using our Kate Center, where we have a cyber range where we could simulate any network or threats for real world experience uh, learning on uh, in the actual environment in a safe way. Uh, I started my career working in military apps uh, through uh, communication, network communication, securing network communication between military vehicles. And then I move over to uh, smart devices to ensure that devices communicating with each other that are secure and protected in, in uh, uh, protected from potential threats. Great, and uh, Donna. 
Hey, Adrian, and thanks. And it's exciting to be here with all these panels. So it's fun to, to kind of wind up um, who we are all here today. I'm at the University of Toronto, and I'm Dr. Donna K. Kidwell, uh, acting CIO, but came here as their chief information security officer after doing that for a while down in Phoenix, Arizona at Arizona State University. So I'm really passionate about large public institutions, large public research institutions, and how we think about protecting the folks that we serve and then how we can extend that trust that we build um, into the rest of our community, uh, making us all stronger together. So I'm, I'm really thoughtful and really eager for the conversation today, because on a university campus, we're about 100,000 students just under that. I think of them as 100,000 of my favorite vulnerabilities. And then, of course, we've got lots of researchers, all of whom are very entrepreneurial and have their own environments, very decentralized. Uh, so in some ways, we're kind of like a small city of small business owners and trying to protect everybody. So I'm really curious uh, to learn from everybody and hear what we've got to do today. Great. Well, uh, maybe I'll start with uh, setting some table stakes then. Uh, you know, we're, we're talking about mush. We're talking about municipalities, universities, school boards, and hospitals. And uh, John, maybe you can start us off by telling us about the unique challenges and circumstances that each of those four face. Yeah, I mean, uh, that, that's a question that could take up our entire panel, I guess, but uh, maybe we'll keep it short and, and to the point. There, there's obviously the unifying thread between the groups that, that they're delivering a public service, uh, they're delivering uh, to stakeholders that uh, that are, are tied in, in many ways to uh, government uh, related funding sources uh, to uh, very high regulatory environments as well. So those are where sort of the commonalities kind of bring the group together. Uh, where things start to deviate and separate tends to be in the constituents that they're serving. When you think about uh, the, the schools and universities, an education environment that Donna's already touched on. You've got academic freedom, you've got students, you've got minors, you've got uh, a lot of information uh, in terms of research and development that's going on, a lot of really sensitive data, the personal identifiable information that is, or PII as we like to talk about it in the vernacular in the space, is, is all over the place and flowing freely sometimes in a way that make cybersecurity people uh, very worried. Um, but uh, from a, a large extent, that's contained to a educational environment. It's contained to what I would consider a non-life-threatening incident. Sure, it, it's very disruptive if your education, your, your classroom's disrupted or you're a student and you can't get to class. And we've seen that with ransomware attacks of locking down schools that, you know, my building management system doesn't work. I can't open a door anymore because no one carries physical keys. But when you get into to say um, service deliveries when it comes to hospitals or municipalities who are responsible for delivering water, delivering electricity, delivering life-saving care, you have a challenge in those industries because they have a life-threatening uh, situation if some of their services are offline or unavailable to to their their constituents and so you immediately have a different level of uh, perhaps anxiety and pressure that's put on to uh, leaders in those environments because it may per create a life and death situation and because of how highly regulated and critical those industries are in terms of infrastructure they're typically dealing with much older IT infrastructure than say some of the, the other universities uh, of the world or, or other private industry who can you know, throw out that laptop every three years and buy a new one. Well, you don't replace a water treatment facility or a hospital or an x-ray machine for maybe decades. And so that just means you're dealing with a different age of technology. And I think those really start to define some differences in how leaders and businesses have to operate and also some of the challenges that they're gonna face uh, when threats uh, could come to them. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, next, this is the next question I'll, I'll throw to Ritesh and David and John, if you wanna get in there, let me know. But, you know, we're talking a lot about schools, so maybe that's a good framing for this in terms of, you know, give us a, a sort of rank, uh, uh, you know, give, a, give us a score on how each of these individual industries is currently doing when it comes to cybersecurity. Uh, maybe Ritesh, start with you. Uh, are we ranking it out of 10? Uh, well, you know, I, A, B, C, you know, whatever. Uh, look, I think uh, 
they're all doing the best they can given the resources that they have. And unfortunately, we're hearing about breaches on a continuous basis. I think it would be very difficult to rank because we're hearing about uh, we're hearing about universities, municipalities that are continuously being hit with things like ransomware, um, being hit with phishing, um, uh, phishing uh, campaigns, uh, different types of exploits as well. So uh, this problem is not going away. In fact, as our lives become more digital, as John mentioned, this issue around legacy systems uh, continues to uh, plague these different industries. We're going to continue to see more breaches that are going to have devastating impacts. Uh, imagine like, the ability to not render services as a municipality, school boards that have been have been shut down. We had libraries um, in Calgary, in Toronto. Some of them just haven't even been able to get back up to 100%. And the reason for that is just how complicated some of these attacks have become and how devastating it's it's expensive to deal with there's a human component to it as well and in some cases when we kind of dissect exactly what happened or we do a po post-mortem a lot of people will say we were trying to figure out how to fly, fly the plane while it was in the air um, goes to show us that there's still huge gaps that need to be addressed definitely more funding so if you were to rank them, who's doing who's doing better? I think that would be unfair. I think uh, there's a lot more that needs to be done collectively because this is only going to get worse. Yeah, fair enough. David, uh, do you want to have a crack at my unfair question? Yeah, I, I, I'm in the same boat there because you know, with with public funding being limited to those areas, there, I think they did the best that they can uh, with the infrastructure that they have, like John said, the legacy systems and all that stuff, just because the budget is not there. So to rank them, it's kind of hard to, to say in that sense. But with the limited budget that they have, I think they're doing a great job. But great job is not good enough in a sense where you're restricted by the budget. It could be done better, right? Uh, so just more funding, I would say. It's hard to rank them. Adrian, I might chime in a little bit on this vibe a little bit, because I think there's there's a conversation here that's important in cybersecurity. I don't think you win by publicly shaming anybody. Uh, I mean, at the end of the day, there's a double-edged sword here. And, and we go through this, and we run a, a service called Canadian Shield, which is um, free for home users to, prov to provide some uh, security on the DNS side for, for the network. Block ransomware and phishing and spyware. And I would look at those data and say, if we had no blocks, is that a good thing? And everybody has 100% perfect security or are we not catching bad things? Um, so to, to some extent, I 100% agree with the data. There are more incidences, more breaches, but I also think we're seeing changing attitudes towards disclosure. And to me, when I talk about this topic, it's how mature are the sectors in talking about the problem? Um, I, I'd really love to get Donna to weigh in because I think the education community in higher ed, what I've observed is the community is talking about it and they're talking about how they're dealing with it and trying to learn from one another. And to me, that's a level of maturity in the process that we should be measuring and we should be looking for all the sectors to be getting to that level or better, right? Not just talking about we got hit, but what do we do to recover faster? What do we do better? And, and, and Donna, maybe you've got some, some thoughts there given your involvement and everything. I'll actually, I'll come back to this, uh, this conversation about uh, talking about it, the, the public shaming piece uh, a little bit later, but uh, I will go to Donna all the same because I will stop doing my divide and conquer uh, uh, thing here and talk to you about collaborating. You know, how can the different industries within the mush sector work together in your estimation, Donna, to push for necessary changes in getting cybersecurity right. Yeah, and I, I, I love the, the framing of the previous question and then this one. And I might offer, you know, it, it's good for us to be able to internally benchmark against one another to understand our maturity and to push one another towards greater maturity through those conversations. But I think that, um, and this is a way of flanking your last question with the answer to the second one, uh, which is we can come together and help to articulate exactly what it is that we're up against 
in such a way that we can help frame the sector and frankly, ask our vendors and suppliers to come meet us where we're at and help us out. So you're seeing this a lot um, with a cybersecurity agency in the United States and a push towards greater transparency on the part of our vendors, greater responsibility, security by design coming from the Microsofts, the AWS. You know, if, if our environments are complex and we're under-resourced and for all sorts of legitimate reasons, we have equipment that is not easy to upgrade and send of life. So we're gonna be susceptible to all of that. One of the ways to flank that is to say, okay, well, give me transparency. Give me the equivalent of a nutrition label. Um, so I don't have to wonder, is my trusted supplier gonna be part of a zero day? Do they have Log4J? Are they a solar winds? You know, all that kind of supply chain. The, the better we are at understanding the environments that we're trusting, the more we're gonna be able to make risk decisions, the more we'll be able to prioritize where we actually need to put a limited number of resources. So I think that's an interesting way that Mush can kind of come together. We're often using the same vendors. We're facing the same sets of challenges. We've got the same kind of resourcing constraints internally, the more we we can articulate and then say, hey, vendor supply chain, help us out, the better off we'll be. Mm -hmm. And I wonder to what degree you think, Donna, the uh, government can be a, a part of that. You know, are there are there federal regulations or, or, or legislation that can be uh, part of this this project? Absolutely. You know, the, the more we've got recommendations, guidelines, standards, policy with the big P, policy with a little P, uh, all of that reinforcing this notion of transparency, um, reinforcing and, and helping us figure out, okay, security by design, privacy by design, we like the sound of it. What does it actually look like when you want to bring something into your environment, when you want to contract? You know, those are all places where all, all, of the, all of the policy to the big P, the little P, all the practices, that's where we actually get that stuff done. Yeah. Uh, Ritesh, uh, maybe you can add on to this as well. You've talked about the significance of uh, bills like uh, C-26 and C-27. Can you tell us about what those are and why, why they're so important? It's important because for the longest time, the, the, the phrase I like to use is we've used 20th century frameworks for 21st century problems. And it's it's about time that we start thinking about the from a legislative perspective, how are we actually going to get into the 21st century? But yes, there's two bills um, that have been uh, that have been introduced. You got Bill C-26, which is a uh, it regulates. Uh, it's kind of being known as a cybersecurity bill, and it applies to essentially three main sectors. You got telcos, you got banks, and you have airlines. And essentially what it does in a nutshell is it forces them to have an audited cybersecurity plan. So they need a program, must be audited by a third party. And then there's also mandatory reporting uh, mechanisms. So you must report if certain type of incidents or thresholds are, are met. So it kind of removes the ambiguity. There is a component of it that I think will come out of it, and those are third-party provisions. So if you want to do business with these organizations that are that fall within the scope of the Bill C-26, then you may be forced to have an audited cybersecurity plan and report certain instances. So you can see all the vendors that are interconnected, and it might be a, a way of getting all these organizations on board and actually thinking about cybersecurity and not just being a checkbox exercise. The second is Bill C-27, and this is probably one that's going to impact more individuals, and that is uh, three components. Uh, the first one is the amendments to PIPITA or redoing PIPITA, which was the previous privacy regime. And the two things to kind of come out of this for me is the plain language doctrine. So when we go on a website or we download an app, and I'm sure everyone does this, you all read the terms of services and you go through it and you read it line by line and you hit, I agree. Here's the, pro here's the thing with that is even sometimes as somebody who's legally trained, even I hit pause and say, what does this actually mean? The, I don't think on the, the average person actually understands what they're hitting, I agree to. And let's face it, most of us just scroll to the bottom and hit I agree. Well, what the plain language does is essentially forces organizations to write things in English, like in simple plain language, not in legalese. So I think that will be a step forward. Uh, there is a consent-based regime as well. So anytime a purpose changes, uh, you need to go back and get consent from individuals. The other two things that it does as well is it creates a privacy tribunal. So the Office of the Privacy Commissioner is going to have that much more powers to make recommendations, um, to uh, enforce certain components of, of the act. 
Uh, and if you don't, then there's a tribunal there, right, to probably levy some significant administrative monetary penalties up to a percentage of global revenue. And the third big component of this and the final component, which seems to also be the most controversial, is looking at regulations around artificial intelligence, mainly high impact AI systems. So dealing with the harms, putting safe safeguards, uh, these are big question marks, but I kind of, I'm going to end this question with uh, with kind of a, a cautionary tale. And that is, it's important to understand that these, yes, we don't have these laws yet. These are bills. Um, they haven't been passed. And if we have an election anytime soon before these become law, we're going to be starting back at, back at ground zero. Um, it's going to be trying to go through these consultations and you're going to have a new government in, in place that may take a different approach to this. So right now we're kind of stuck with those 20th century frameworks. We're trying to bring it into the 21st century. Uh, but th these are kind of the things that we're seeing uh, from a legislative standpoint in Canada. And, and I'll just actually hop quickly back to Donna, just because, uh, you know, a, a law that's on the provincial level that has passed recently is Bill 194. And Donna, I wonder if you can speak very quickly to that, too. Yeah, I, I, I love that we're, you know, having conversations about how to actually put these into regulatory and then what does that look like for practice? So the idea of having, you know, privacy statements that are radically readable, um, just, just love that. Um, I, I think that we are now getting so good at understanding how to interact on, you know, on things like our, our phones. Um, that we can actually shift a little bit how we ask for consent. Like we could ask for consent when it matters. Um, so let's say you had a radically readable thing where a student said, oh yeah, you can use my data that way. And then later, because we're a research institution, we're like, hey, we think we could use your data in this way. A little micro interaction, a little chat that said, hey, we have this idea now, what do you think? And you can opt in, opt out in micro levels, like it's a whole different world. And yet our mechanisms for this still look like, you know, 15, 20 years ago on the web. So there's a lot of opportunity for us to take that. With something like Bill 194, I think what's really interesting in that conversation is the fact that it pulls together cybersecurity, privacy, and AI. So we're not trying to divide and conquer all of us um, from the from the perspective of the MUSH community are worth really worried about death by a thousand compliance cuts, like how much of this burden is going to shift into already, already overtaxed um, groups inside of our own campuses. And like, who wants an office of compliance? You want people doing wonderful work that is compliant, not having to have a bureaucratic layer on top of it that's not actually getting to the services we want to provide. So I, I love that Bill 194 is bundling all these things together. I think that pulls a real nice way for us to think in terms of the elegance of what at its heart is safety. If you have safety and security on that side, then what's the layer that we want for privacy? And then if, because you've got to have the safety before you can be um, assuring that it's private. And then on top of that, how are we thinking about putting this together in practice for AI? That's a really elegant uh, step. I'm also interested in how they're bringing back um, the feedback from individuals. So having brand new to Canada and kind of watching this one, because uh, it started just as I was starting my journey here, um, started the socializing. I love that they're actually reaching out to areas of expertise. They're getting really solid feedback now that it's uh, gone into law, but how they're actually going to put it into practice. And somewhere in the next couple months, we'll actually see it come out for public discussion. So I, I just think that leaning into that is the way we'll be able to make these things more practical for us. Mm -hmm. And that really speaks to the, the sort of collision, this belief that for folks that uh, cybersecurity is an opposition to efficiency, but uh, for folks that's that's a big part of the challenge here. Uh, I'll take it to David here and uh, going back again to this uh, idea of partnerships within MUSH. Can you tell us about some of the partnerships you've worked on to help bridge cybersecurity gaps? Uh, an example of partnership that we uh, work with is the uh, University of Calgary. Uh, we set up a, a kit center for uh, to provide cybersecurity training to professionals and also to students, where we have a cyber range that's hosted at the University of Calgary data center. So this cyber range, you can, like I mentioned earlier, that you can simulate uh, digital environment, uh, networks, or threats. So by having this environment for, for students to use, they can develop uh, real uh, world skills when they actually finish 
let's say, school. Uh, for example, at the at the University of Calgary, there's a, a master's program called Master of Information Security and Privacy, where one of the course, an ethical hacking course, students can go on to the system and and work on, let's say, attacks, create an environment that could attack a system in a replicated way and in a safe way, and another student can try to defend. Uh, so that's one of the, the partnership that we do to, to, uh, to, uh, to narrow that uh, cybersecurity gap. Uh, another partnership that we actually do is, is uh, working with the Calgary Police, where because we have the, uh, the environment to replicate malware and viruses, we can do research and development and also find out trends in the, in the cybersecurity world and, and share that trend with the Calgary Police. Great. Uh, John, do you want to speak to that too, uh, uh, the partnerships you've worked on? Yeah, I mean partnerships. And I mean, I, I might take a quick uh, a quick aside on just a comment there that David made, which is the whole element of, of training. Uh, it's very key that we 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 think about cybersecurity training not from a compliance checkbox perspective, but from a changing behavior perspective. And the, the nice thing about the types of approaches that Dave is talking about is that you are rerunning these types of training, you're looking for a, a shift in behavior as an outcome, focus on the, the learning outcome, as opposed to saying, I checked a box for an insurance, uh, an insurance requirement. And the more that we bring that into our mindset when tackling that, it makes it a lot easier to, to, to train technical and non-technical people. If you're focused on changing the behavior, as opposed to just saying, I did some training, um, that shift in, in mindset, I think, is a major one that, that I'm seeing and, and I'm really excited about. Um, but on the partnership perspective, there's definitely uh, a lot of them. CIRA is a, a 135-people organization uh, at cybersecurity team sport. You know, it doesn't matter if you're a billion-dollar organization or a small one like CIRA. We, we all need partners. Uh, we certainly have seen a lot of, of work. We like to talk about communities of trust. Uh, and certainly one that we've had a lot of success with is a partnership in the higher ed space uh, organization, uh, Canary, as well as regional education networks. Uh, they work together to build a real robust uh, network interconnection between all the research universities. Well, as imagine as those connections get bigger and better in order to facilitate research and exchange of data, it also creates a bigger security risk because you're now all interconnected. Uh, and so quite rightfully, those groups are looking about how do they secure those communications, secure those interactions. And what they're doing is coming together and saying, these are where we, we can share resourcing, where we can share approaches. So rather than all of us doing the same security control 300 times, well, let's build up centers of excellence. Let's build up uh, centers of expertise where we can support one another. And Sarah has been uh, really active within that group to help doing things like uh, in threat intel sharing. Like when we talk about a lot of the, like C26, 194, even the, the Canadian uh, program for cybersecurity certification, that's they're all starting to circle around how do we get data on issues? How do we report uh, breaches? How do we make those mandatory? How do we get more information in people's hands? And these communities and these partnerships between private and, and, and public sector, uh, when done right, are going to facilitate the movement of information and data and learning in a much more uh, you know, efficient manner. And sort of the, the primary example of that are like indicators of compromise. You know, if, if a bunch of groups detect something going on in the network, well, why not share that information securely with your other much sector compatriots so that they don't get hit by those things later on? And uh, those areas and those the tech stack of an enablement, uh, the partnership of doing that together, I think is where we really start to see some uh, some uh, movement on, on long-term sustainable programs. Mm -hmm. Well, I wanna dive a little deeper about, uh, on something that John, you just mentioned, but also was at the heart of what David and Donna said recently, which is uh, this idea that cybersecurity is a team sport and that uh, you know cybersecurity also only kind of works when professional everyday people, you know, people like me, believe that that's important and develop fundamental skills, do it in their day-to-day -day, uh, -day -day practice. 
Um, but mush, you know, these are these are folks who are often overworked. Uh, they have a lot of other stuff going on, whether it's at work or beyond. Uh, how do you, what are, what are the actual ways in which we can uh, adjust that behavior so that cybersecurity is a priority for people in their daily lives? I'll, I'll sort of open it up to the group. I don't know if anyone wants to speak to that first. Sure, I'll get started if that's okay. Um, so to, to me, I think cybersecurity is today where health and safety was 20, 30 years ago. So 20, 30 years ago, it's you, you go on to, let's say, a construction site, and it's like, do I have to wear a hard hat? Do I got to wear steel toe boots? Do I got to wear my PPE? Uh, everything will be okay. Why do I got to do all these uh, checks and balances and, and wear all this PPE? Well, today, we wouldn't think twice before going on to a construction site without wearing appropriate PPE. It's just it's been ingrained into the culture. And I think if we use like that similar analogy, I think cybersecurity is today where health and safety was 20 30 years ago it's it's starting to it's not it's starting to become something that's ingrained uh, within an organization, people are watching the news, they're reading the Globe and Mail and hearing about breaches on a continuous basis. And and it's like, and these are discussions that are actually happening in the boardroom. There's a lot of questions around it. How much money should we be spending? Do we have the adequate resources in place? And that's why I think kind of, and I'm sure we'll get into this a little bit later on, but you know, at a very high level, it's important that you have these difficult conversations, as Donna mentioned, you know, work with your vendors, right? I guarantee that your vendors want, it doesn't help them if you go down and there's resources in place. You may have premier support hours that are being underutilized. Uh, you may have security features that you're paying for that just haven't been enabled. So, you know, do an audit of your systems, reach out to the vendors, have those discussions. This doesn't have to be expensive, uh, you know, maybe 90% or 80% of the issues can be mitigated away uh, just by having these conversations. So I think it's a, it's a progress, but like cybersecurity is today where health and safety was 20 years ago. I, I kind of push in a little bit that cybersecurity is not a nine to five um, adventure, right? Uh, I think it's it's quite often we talk about cybersecurity, it's like we do all these great things at the office. Uh, then I go home and I ignore all of those best practices and do nothing. Uh, and that became a big uh, apparent uh, issue for everyone uh, that was front and center when we went through the pandemic and your lines between home and office blurred. And all of a sudden, uh, corporate IT uh, in, sort of say, oh, my gosh, what's going on on your home network? What do you how are you accessing our services? And so it, to Ritesh's point, it, it's it's on me to protect my my information and that. I get the benefit of that working at a, at a shop that has a cybersecurity practice when I'm at work, but am I taking a lens at what I'm doing at home? You know, am I giving away too much information for a discount coupon online? I, we do have to consider that things like our biometrics that we use for security purposes or logging on to services, those don't change. Uh, so it's not like, oh, my password got breached. Let me create a new one. Uh, my retina scan got compromised, let me get new eyeballs, doesn't work. Uh, so we do need to look at a, a situation where baseline education is part of what we understand. What are my basic um, cyber hygiene at home? Do I, do I back up my material? Do I use a password manager? Do I use multi-factor authentication? These things are all out there in, generally speaking, free to very low cost solutions that are accessible. Um, from a, a public good perspective, there's work for organizations like CIRA and others to do to make sure that those that cost doesn't become a barrier to access. Um, we had our moment with antivirus where that went from being a really expensive thing you bought in the 90s to something you get for free. Uh, and to Ritesh's point, you don't go online with a computer without having antivirus on your computer anymore. It's just what you got to do. And so I think the more we continue to talk and normalize, these are the basics that you need to know and do, uh, the better we're going to be as a society and the easier the job is going to get at the corporate or enterprise level because uh, we'll all be aware of it. And there's ideally less thing, bad things hitting those networks because people aren't as big of a threat vector. Mm -hmm. John, I want to build on that a little bit because I, I love a couple things that you mentioned. 
you know, a few years ago, a lot of us organizationally were like, oh no, we've got to do MFA. We got to roll out MFA. And now if you had a bank that didn't have MFA, you probably wouldn't want to bank there. And if you've got a vendor for which the MFA seems a little kludgy, uh, you notice as a consumer, we notice. So I think that kind of like give yourself some credit as a savvy person uh, to say, okay, yeah, that felt like a digital experience for which I trust them. And then also kind of take that discernment because I think of this as a lot of cyber discernment, take that discernment and say, yeah, not so trustworthy. These guys over here don't have the same respect for me as these guys and use the ones that you think really do a good job of it. And frankly, like they give you little surveys, give them feedback and say that was a good job. And the other ones answer those surveys, like surveys are helpful. Uh, tell them when they're not doing a good job. I, I also love, John, that you mentioned password managers and I have to put a plug for this because it's like the holiday season, you're going to be hanging out with family. There's no better time to say, hey, fam, um, I paid for an annual family subscription to a password manager. And uh, last year at Christmas, I sure did that. I sat down with my dad and I'm like, okay, give me the lockbox for the cabin. Like, let's just walk through all these things and actually have that culture uh, together. And yeah, there's no better time than to do something painful, but do it with fun over the holidays and some really good pie. There you go. David, do you have a, a quick thought there? Yeah, I, I love what Donna just said, uh, sharing her knowledge with with family members. And that's what we, uh, I, have, I have three kids and I talk to them about, you know, being safe online, being, you know, make sure if you're playing games, make sure you know who you're playing with. So I think nowadays, you know, uh, cybersecurity is kind of uh, common, like Ritesh said, common now in a sense where people are thinking of, you know, I'm, I'm not going to give all my information out, right? Uh, to make sure that uh, we're all protected in some ways. Right. Well, so, you know, we talked then about uh, everyday folks, everyday professionals, people, you know, the workers. But what about, uh, what about senior leadership? I think that that's constantly a challenge whenever there's a cyber attack. The, the effort to communicate between technical and non-technical senior leadership can be a real challenge. So uh, how, do we, how, do we, how do we process that, Ritesh? I think it was Leonard Shallon wrote in the book, Art and Physics, he said, a artist expresses the nature of reality through metaphors and a physicist investigates the nature of reality using equations and mathematics. It's the exact same thing. They're just speaking different languages. And that's kind of very synonymous to, you know, and I've been in the room when organizations have been, have been breached where you have, you know, you just got to put yourself in that position where there's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of uncertainty. People are under a lot of pressure. You have, you, you may be lacking business continuity plans, so you can't reach customers. Um, the, the technical individuals you may need uh, are, are overworked. Um, you may have insurance companies, lawyers, forensic experts. It's, um, it, it's very difficult to deal with those situations. That's why I think prevention is so much better than a cure and kind of going through and doing tabletop exercises, having these discussions. You shouldn't learn to fly a plane when it's in the air. And I've used that analogy before, but it it's so true. And the the way I try to explain it to senior leadership and to technical folks as well is, you know, prepare, 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 because if you don't, if you don't, then, you know, essentially prepare to fail. Um, the example I like to give is we do it really well in the physical world. Think about when the fire alarm goes off, uh, you know, when we think about fire safety, we got alarms to notify individuals. We got monitoring with uh, smoke detectors. You may have sprinkler systems. That's a prevent preventative measure. Uh, you know where to muster or uh, go outside to a particular place. Uh, you do roll call attendance. You call 911. The fire truck shows up. You have insurance in place. You might have some sort of continuity. You know, are we going to go to a hotel? Are we going to um, are we going to work from home? We kind of have those processes in the physical world, but not so much in the virtual world. What are we going to do when those cyber alarms go off? And many times it's not Monday to Friday, eight to four, when these uh, systems are going down, it is two, three in the morning on a Friday or Saturday. So do we have the right resources? Have we practiced this stuff? And I think the more tabletop exercises we do, the more preparing 
uh, we do, both these sides, the technical and the business side, will start speaking the same language. And are there practical ways that you can think of beyond the tabletop exercises that you can upskill and increase literacy just on a general basis for those senior business leaders? I, I think having discussions, right? I, we, we do it with uh, every other element of the business, right? We do it with how we're going to increase sales. Uh, we do it with HR related concerns. We have town halls. Uh, every Just about every organization has, has some sort of training schedule. And I think building in cybersecurity is, is super important, making sure that you're posting it on your intranet, on the bulletin boards, you're having these discussions, you're ingraining it into the culture of an organization. It is what is what's going to save you uh, time and time again i hear from organizations when we kind of do a post-mortem of exactly what happened um, individuals are just like look i i thought this email was suspicious but i didn't know what to do with it or i just assumed uh that it was sent to us from the ceo or the cfo so i went ahead and made the payment or i opened the open the attachment they don't go through and verify it or they don't just do go the old school way of pick up the phone and validate and verify. Hey, did you just tell me to change the billing information or did you send me this uh, document from your personal email? Go that extra mile and build that into the culture. And that is the only way that we're going to be able to protect ourselves. This is, you know, we say people process and technology. It is not the opposite. Technology is not going to fix the problem. Putting processes isn't going to fix the problem. It's going to be people. So it's people process technology, not technology process people. Yeah. And let's let's hone in a little bit on the, on the people aspect and go back to what we were talking a bit before about uh, the public shaming of it all. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll, and in the context of cybercrime, uh, the RCMP has said that one thing that makes it tougher to tackle cybercrime, in particular ransomware, is that individuals and companies still prefer not to report them to law enforcement, prefer not to talk about it at all. Uh, Donna, you are inside an institution, so I'm wondering if you can speak to the fact that there is this stigma that uh, that, that can be such a, a problem in, in tackling cybercrime. Uh, thank you. Thank you for asking. I, I think this is one of the first things that you should bring up if you're doing an executive tabletop. Um, and it is one of the first things that that if I'm doing one for a, a university president, I ask. Um, and that framing is, you know, what tone do you want us to respond with as we go forward into this very nonlinear, very messy, all sorts of stuff we don't know going in? Like, what's the tone? And I think I ask that question because we have the opportunity to frame the adversity as a tone of resilience, a tone of we've got your back community and we are going through this together. Um, not a tone of shame or trying to hide it, but a tone of we are stronger than the adversary. Um, at this point, we're not surprised when these things happen. We recognize it's, um, in fact, the vernacular among CISOs is it's not uh, if, it's when. So why try to hide away from it? Instead, I think, have a proactive discussion about what resilience looks like, how you message that, what the emails look like when you send them out, what the banner messages on your webpage actually say, um, and, and reinforce that kind of sense of resilient uh, being able, uh, we use, um, uh, some of us use the term anti-fragility. You know, we're not only facing the adversary, but we're stronger on the other side of it. So I, I think it really starts there with like, what's your mindset going in? Mm -hmm. And uh, here's a question that's sort of related, which is, uh, Ritesh, earlier you mentioned the, a human component in recovery from a ransom attack. Can you speak to uh, an example of what that human component is? Yeah, so, and I, and I, for anyone that's ever dealt with a breach, right? You'll one thing that always stood out to me was um, just how stressed out every member of the organization was. Like you're pulling 30, 40, 50 hours straight in some cases, trying to figure out a what's happening. I call that you know stopping the bleeding. You're bringing in uh, you're bringing in resources, usually forensic analysts, um, lawyers, uh, consultants to kind of coach you through a breach. That's extremely stressful um, and expensive. Uh, and then you're kind of dealing with the aftermath. You have customers that you have to deal with. You have your constituents that you got to deal with. And that stuff is very stressful. So one thing I always tell organizations is, again, and we, we spoke about this, you know, it's people process then technology, but put the people first. Um, understand that the entire organization is going to be under a tremendous amount of stress and make sure that people are well fed, that they're resting, 
um, that there uh, that there's resources in place uh, um, to deal with any type of trauma um, that they may be that they may be facing. Make sure that they have arrangements for uh, family members as well. I think that's really important when you're dealing with a breach. It's going to be all hands on deck. Uh, you will need your people. There's no one better than your people. They know the systems. They know what to do. They got that personal relationship with vendors and customers. Consultants aren't going to be able to come in and fix everything. They'll be able to help, but not fix everything. So very important you don't negate the fact that um, that w this is going to end. There is going to be an end date. You will be able to get back up and running. It might take a while, but y you don't want to be in a situation where you've lost your staff because they're 100% going to burn out um, based on my experience on dealing with these types of breaches. Great. We have uh, 15 minutes left and we have a fair few questions from the audience. So I want to uh, put them out there to folks to be as useful as possible, but we'll try to keep our answers real tight here. But uh, one question is, uh, what do the panelists think about the standards such as uh, ISO 27001 or the National Institute of Standards and Technology and IST? Why not encourage these organizations to go through a simple gap analysis to know where they are and what needs to be done? I'm wondering if folks want to tackle that. Uh, I love the use of simple in phrasing that question because there's nothing about ISO certification or NIST standards that are simple. Um, they are very valuable tools if you have the capacity to unpack them and track them in your organization. And they should be used because they reinforce the importance of things like business continuity plans, tabletop exercises. Um, there's some real interesting uh, survey we do every year at CIRA. Go to CIRA.ca, download it. But um, there's something for uh, 70 or 80% of organizations that indicate they have a business continuity plan. That is a great number. In the MUSH sector, I would argue that all organizations of any size need to, to Ritesh's point, know what they do and know what your people's roles are when an issue happens. ISO and NIST help create these frameworks around how you test these things and maybe define them, but you don't necessarily have to go to that huge monstrosity of a framework level to achieve uh, some goals. But, uh, but understanding the basic concepts, I think, are, are critical to every organization. Donna, David, anything uh, you want to throw in there? I'll, I'll just add that you know they they are fantastic tools for kind of helping you across a complex organization um, talk about what's important. Uh, you can use them to help you prioritize. You can use them to help understand and and you know I, I really appreciate we we are in a state of maturity. The landscape is also changing, so maturity today doesn't necessarily stick uh, three years out. So if you're trying to plan for complex things that take a lot of coordination, that take a lot of resourcing, being able to benchmark yourself against and pick the standard that that actually matches the work that you're doing, um, that is so, so helpful. I do think that one of the things that we lose sight of is that what's really important is that you've got a plan of action and milestones. Uh, the CMMC standard calls those POAMs. If you've got a plan and you can rally around that, that's fabulous. So, you know, give yourself some compassion for where you actually stand once you do the heavy lifting and mapping yourself to one of these standards and figure out where you want to go. Uh -huh. So uh, the next question here is uh, whether or not there is a national report card on Canadian public institution data safety. Uh, and if not, why not? I'll, I'll Maybe I'll get started. Um, not really. Uh, I don't think that there is a that there is a report card or a data card on who's doing um, who's doing what the, the Canadian Anti-Fraud Centre does put out. Uh, does put out a report on reported fraud. And again, a lot of the data and the report cards that are out there, you know, some sector specific are based on reported data. And as we just talked about in the previous questions, um, one of the, you know, there is still the stigma attached to it. So I think that a lot of these issues are underreported. Um, different countries are trying to take different approaches. Australia just passed the cyber bill. Uh, the whole idea there is you must report if you pay a ransom. I know the Biden-Harris administration was even thinking about criminalizing the payment of ransomware. Uh, so and increasing uh, fines for failure to report. So th these are kind of th different countries, different organizations, different sectors are taking a different approach. But is there like one specific place that we can go to? 
no. Uh, there are these overarching reports, uh, mainly around reported incidents, kind of taking a fraud lens to it, or if there was victimization. But do we know how many hospitals were uh, impacted, how many municipalities, uh, how many school boards? I think that is just based on reporting that we hear about in the media. I don't think that there is uh, a single source of or a place where we can go and get that get that data, from my understanding. Okay. Um, a question, another question for the group. Uh, what responsibility does the government have in helping higher education, in particular, meet their financial obligations to meet the growing needs of cybersecurity? Because it's not free. Uh, this is probably going to go to Donna again, but again, welcome to anyone else who wants to jump in. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll kick, us, kick it off. It's hard stuff to do. So I think, you know, understanding that that we are trying to and working very hard to do the right thing on our side and then identifying what are the different funding mechanisms um, and how to frame those such that they push forth the needle in the right places. So by that, I mean, you know, we've got uh, research and that research is particularly interesting to nation states um, or to the ability to move and commercialize things into industry. That's a whole different kind of security thinking um, than the side that's really protecting privacy or in U of T's case where we're working with hospitals and we're trying to think about how we want to work with hospitals. So I think part of the question is how do you put together strategically the right approach to the bills that we talked earlier, for example, alongside funding mechanisms that help us to move the meter where we need them to be and recognize that you know internally we're prioritizing and struggling with that every day. Anyone else want to jump in on that before we move on to the next question? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a there's an interesting challenge. There's a carrot and stick conversation to always be had, right? Which is how do you incent the right behavior? And I think we've, we've referenced CMMC and some procurement uh, uh, approaches where the government has now started to say, if you want to sell uh, certain services in the government, then you need to have certain cybersecurity quality uh, and, uh, and artifacts to prove you're doing doing right. And so uh, I think that's one great way that all large institutions, government and non-government can help the security game move forward, which is I look for the eco-friendly sticker. Am I buying from people who are cyber aware, doing good cyber things and making sure that people who invest in that for their products are rewarded commercially. Uh, and I think that the government's made some really great steps towards doing that and that'll help all sectors, not just higher ed. Uh, the the other side of it, to a certain degree, I think as well, is you can't regulate uh, everything because the speed of the cybersecurity changes are moving, right? So the government is making a lot of attempts to try to do general uh, work. So Sir has been a big supporter of the intent of C26 and trying to get, again, reporting and visibility to what's going on more uh, apparent across the, the world, but also be more transparent with uh, the public on the type of data that's being collected and what it's being used for. So in cybersecurity, uh, quite often success boils down to trust. If you can build trust between organizations and communities, then data is going to be shared more freely. Uh, people are going to share their techniques. And I think that's also a way the government can help, uh, can help in this way, is helping those communities build trust with one another, uh, driving standards, because uh, a lot of what we're doing today isn't necessarily governed by a standard way of doing it. So it's hard to share that information or it's hard to work together. Uh, and those are, I think, great areas where uh, energy and, and investment can be made and have cross-sector impact. Mm. Let's talk a little bit more about actually the limits of government. This is uh, tied to a question we received uh, because we've talked a lot about uh, the potential uh, ways in which legislation can really help. But uh, the cybersecurity insurance business, says this uh, person in uh, the audience, seem to be raising their expectations of not only what cyber, uh, what security and privacy capabilities are in place, but also how these capabilities are managed and kept current. Uh, this reader or this audience member also thinks uh, insurance demands will drive more improvement than legislation, which seems to just create more tick box approaches. Um, thoughts on, on on that? Maybe David, do you want to get us started? Um, for insurance wise, I, I, I guess it's always good to um, have insurance to protect, you know, protect your assets, let's say, uh, as how government uh, 
can step in to help. Uh, I, I would leave that to Ritesha. Ritesha, if you could expand that, he's more of the legal side of things. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, okay, then I guess I'll I'll jump in. Uh, thanks for uh, throwing me in there, David. Appreciate <laughs> yeah. it. Um, yeah. So look, from the, I'll break it up into two, and I know we're getting short on time, so I'll keep my mm -hmm. answer short. But kind of from the insurance side, one of my one of the big issues here is that you do have to do something like you need to have training you need to have uh you got to have uh software and systems in place before you can get the insurance uh, you, and you have to keep it up to date kind of in a unrelated way of thinking about this is yeah we all have vehicle insurance but um if you're driving reckless and impaired and you hit someone um you, you can imagine the issues that that's going to cause you because you didn't you, you you didn't check off all those boxes you you didn't uh, think things through and you got behind the wheel. So it's it's no different, I think, with cyber insurance. And, and I have seen situations uh, globally uh, where insurance companies have failed, uh, said we're not actually going to pay out uh, because you failed as an organization to meet these minimum requirements. And that's devastating when all of a sudden now you have this, you know, you've been paying into a premium and they're not willing to, to pay out. So that's kind of the first component. The second thing around the legislative uh, the legislative side of this um, and kind of building on John's point um, and Donna's around vendors, I think we can do more. Um, I do agree, like sometimes a lot of legislation isn't really the answer. we got to have standards, industry standards, uh, maybe trade associations that say, look, buy from these vendors because they're, uh, you know, we, we vetted them and they're tried, tested and true. But we're seeing countries like the UK, for example, that have actually passed legislation, uh, in particular for IoT connected devices, saying, look, if you're going to participate and sell to businesses and consumers, you, you can't use default credentials. So like admin or password one, two, three cannot be a default. Um, you must have security updates and you must have a person, uh, a security contact that individuals can connect with if they have security related concerns. So we are seeing different elements of this globally, but it's just really important that we have kind of this play ball, this, this play of dealing with uh, cyber related uh, questions and inquiries, especially as we vet vendors, um, because we can't wait for the government to pass legislation and and uh, and create this ecosystem. We kind of have to do it ourselves. Yeah. David, I'm going to ask you actually a very specific question since I, I threw to the wrong person on that one. My bad. Uh, uh, can you tell us more? It's a very specific one from a member of the audience who I think has a stake in the U of Calgary Library. Can you tell us more about the U of Calgary Library issue you mentioned? Right now, the Open Access Online International Journal is not functioning. Is that due to this larger issue? Right. So I think it was October that the Calgary, uh, Calgary Library got hit with a uh, ransom attack. Uh, so I have to say that they had a really good process in place. The minute that they discovered that there was an attack, they shut down all the server. Uh, they, they shut down all the computer systems because they did that quickly and swiftly. They prevented any data breaches, any data loss, whether customers or, or uh, business uh, data. Because they... I guess because the protocol and recovery plan, they had a well-planned uh, recovery plan to go through all the phases to bring the system back online. First, they did, um, I believe, uh, they, they brought up the employees network, and then they slowly brought up the services to the public, and then they brought up the system for all 23 locations. So because they had that plan in place, and even though having a plan in place doesn't mean going to be a success recovery, you actually have to practice, right? You have to rehearse those plans. Having it written down is one thing, uh, but exercising it is another. So it was evident that they did do rehearsal, make sure all the employees understand what they need to do. And because of that, they really prevented any uh, uh, ransom payment. Great. So this journal access thing might be a might be a different thing altogether. Mm -hmm. It sounds like. Um, right, we'll just have one more question here then, um, which is about the. We talked a lot about the regulatory environment, the legislative environment. Uh, people love to ask this question. 
what, how does Canada uh, stack up against folks like America uh, in terms of that environment? How are we doing? Uh, anyone want to take a quick crack at that in our last minutes here? We're going to end on one of the more complicated questions anybody could ask. There you go. <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll start off with a quick thing. Um, these are hard questions, and I am really impressed uh, in my six months here so far with the way we're having the dialogue. Um, I'm still very much learning how the conversation happens at the provincial level, how that then happens at the national level. Um, so I'll have to defer to some of my colleagues for that. But I will say that in the United States, each state has so much agency over how they want to um, to approach any of these things that you'll see states like California that then become essentially bellwethers and really push forward. But then uh, last I looked, there were nine different initiatives, nine different states going after privacy. So from a municipal point of view, from a mush point of view, it's pretty daunting if you're working with um, constituencies that are outside your state. Most universities are. So I, I'm really appreciative at how coordinated the conversation seems to be and how eager, you know, I, I guess my impression at least is that we are interested in highly functioning governance uh, for the most part, and that's got to serve us well. But I'll, I'll defer to my colleagues who've been here longer and might know more. I, mean, I think Canada is in a, a very interesting position where we're we're not the first movers we're definitely not the, the the laggards here either there's a great opportunity to learn uh from what's worked uh what hasn't um you know and i nis one i nis two in europe a lot of australian uh legislation american legislation there's great opportunity to take the best uh of what we've seen uh and apply it uh judiciously here in canada and i think we're seeing some of that uh, and that's great. Uh, but to Donna's point, we can't forget what it means to be Canadian. Uh, we need to put a Canadian lens on it just because it works in Europe or just because it works in the US doesn't mean it works here. And so uh, getting through the public consultation process, getting through the stakeholder consultation process uh, is important uh, because lawmakers may not be experts on how parts of the internet work or parts of that work. So that collaboration between uh, public and private sector, uh, us as, as advocates and experts in the sector, getting out and talking about it, uh, individuals learning about the problems and, and raising a voice are going to make uh, all of these efforts uh, better. And it's going to make us better better protected uh, if we understand these issues better. So I hope if, uh, if nothing else, the conversation becomes more and more accessible to more and more people as we go through it, because I think it's a critical time uh, in, in, the, in the country uh, for these issues. Okay, well, I think we're going to, have to leave it there. So on behalf of the Globe and Mail, I want to thank John, David, Donna, and Ritesh for joining us today. I also want to thank everyone in the audience for your uh, remarkable questions. Uh, and of course, Sira for supporting today's event. Uh, we'll be sharing a link to this recorded webcast in about a week. Uh, so yeah, thank you again everything for every everything, everyone, and enjoy your day. <laughs>